Um, but now that you're here, I just would love for you to take a second and just close your eyes a minute. Yes. Put one hand on your chest and say after me, I am here on purpose. I belong here. Someone loves me here. Someone likes me here. If I weren't here, I'd be missed. I am here for a reason. And I open my mind and my heart to receive something special just for me tonight. In Jesus' name. Woohoo! Okay. Well, I am super excited to be with you. And I know that I have the tendency to talk a long time, but it is a personal goal of mine that you guys get to do small groups tonight, right? Because you guys love small groups. And I want you to get the most out of your youth Wednesday night experience. So I am committed to that. I'm committed to that. I can do this. We can do this. So as you may know, some of you may recognize this little book right here. It is a um, illuminated scripture journal um, of the book of John. And with daughters, we are going through it. There's several faces that are familiar to me and that recognize this because you have your own, because you come, you've come. And anyone who hasn't come is more than welcome to come um, anytime. So, but the book of John has been so insightful. And when I was praying and thinking, what, Lord, what will you have me share with the youth tonight whom I love? I like love you guys so much. I mean, two of you are legitimately my children, but the rest of you are just inherently just ours. You're ours. And when I say, when I ask you to say that you belong here and that you're loved here, it's because I love you. And I know Jonathan feels the same way. I know you're probably thinking, no, Pastor Jonathan doesn't even look in my dress. You know he loves you. You know he loves you. I know he loves you because we pray for you. And we're just just so proud of you like parents are you know like parents are all like oh I keep your picture close to me in my heart and I show it to everyone that's how we are we're proud of you so but anyway the book of John has been so special and I had been praying Lord what will you have me share and I felt like something that I had recently read and seen in the book of John I just wanted to share with you because I thought this is really impactful so John 20, 31 says this, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See, the verse before that was saying there were many other signs and wonders that Jesus did while he was on this earth. But these ones are written almost like saying it's making a case for Jesus's last name like he belongs to God he is the son of God and he came Messiah is actually a word that means anointed one so it's Christ just one is Greek and the other one is Aramaic but both of them mean anointed the anointed one the one that the people of Israel had waited for and that upon meeting him they didn't all quite believe that it was him so I know that you guys have been talking about testimonies, right? You've heard many people here share their testimony. Um, and I bet you guys have um, maybe favorite ones, maybe some that you're like, yeah, I can relate. And some of them that you're like, no, I cannot relate to your testimony. You're a weird staff person. <laughs> That's okay, you know. <laughs> the thing about testimonies and families and background is that they kind of set up a stage, right? A stage for a personal story. And so how important is it that we know who we are and where we come from, right? Because if our story, if that's kind of like the launching point for our story and for our mission and for what, what God will have us accomplish in our lives, it's pretty important. Well, to Jesus, it was everything, you see, because he wasn't just Mary and Joseph's son, right? Like he was that because he was 100% man in the sense that if we were to meet him today, he would have flesh and bones, which let me blow your mind, he still has. Isn't that weird? I mean, like when I read that recently, when I realized that recently, I was like, it's true. He still has a body. 
in heaven, right? Because he never died. His body is, so he's still 100% man, but he's also 100% God, right? And so he came, and the people that he came to, I love that because Pastor Jonathan said this this past Sunday, and I just wrote in my notes, and I had to put it in my notes here again, because he said Jesus came to a society who knew about God. But he came to show them God's love in action so that they would actually know God. You know there's a difference between knowing about someone and then knowing that person. I feel like in the day and age that we live in today with celebrities and their Instagram and how we see like maybe on social media everything about everyone. And you're like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what that person is doing. I know where they go to eat on Sundays. I know what kind of clothes they buy. I know where they shop. I know, I know so many things about this person. But then have you seen them like in public and you're like, I know too much about that person. <laughs> and that person doesn't know me. <laughs> and I... I couldn't even talk to them because I don't know them. But I know so much about them. And it's so weird. It's so weird. It's so weird. It's one of the strangest dynamics that we have in our society today. And it so happened that the people of Israel were like this. They knew about God because they carried with them and their ancestors and in their history so many signs and wonders that the God of ages, that the God of, of Abraham, the God of Moses had operated, had done for them miraculous things. And they had that as an, they had even rituals and traditions, just like we're about to celebrate Thanksgiving because, you know, many years ago, um, a group of people met another group of people and they had a feast together. And that became a tradition that we all have carried. Like that's, there were details about that meeting that we don't know. And maybe we will never know. But the only thing that we know is that it's tradition. And in this season, this is what we do. And we celebrate and we honor that and we give thanks and we eat a lot. We eat a lot. And yum. And thank goodness, right? And so we, we know that. And so the people of Israel had many traditions. They also had many rules and regulations in what they call the law of Moses. And so it was like... There were people who were experts in the law, and they, uh, and they just upheld really tight traditions about being Jewish. It was like a pride and joy of theirs. And even though they knew what the scripture had said, that it had prophesied that a Messiah would come, that an anointed one, a special one, right, would come to set them free, to be a gateway to God. Um, and they knew they were anticipating this. It's like they had their thoughts and opinions and ideas and so many decades and centuries of people's thoughts and ideas about God that they saw Jesus and they couldn't recognize him. They could not, they could not see in him, oh, you are the one that God sent for us. Some people had ideas about Jesus, like he's going to come and he's going to be like just ripped and he's going to be like, I have all the weapons that we need to like defeat the Romans and we're gonna set ourselves free and we're gonna regain our territory. And they thought that he was gonna be like this military man in action. <laughs> and Jesus was not that. <laughs> and so they were so disappointed. And to some people, it was just really annoying that Jesus was this person from Nazareth. Like, because the scripture said, like, nothing good comes from Nazareth. Like, how rude is that? <laughs> Can we just talk about that for a minute? It's just very rude. But anyway, in chapter 6, it so happens that Jesus feeds thousands with just a little, right? And this is just one of his signs and wonders that take people by surprise, right? Because they were all like, this guy, like, he's walking around doing these things, these miracles, that is like, too many of them is like, is he, does he have a demon? No, but like, if he had a demon, he couldn't do good things, right? Because that doesn't work. Um, so they were just troubled about who he was. Some called him a prophet. And right after he fed the thousands, they were like, let's make this guy our king. Remember? Because they were like, this guy, if he can take five loaves, five loaves, Five fishes? I don't remember the math. Thank you, you guys. <laughs> Thank you. I do read my Bible. I just don't remember math details, always. Um, but, like, it, they were like, if he can do this with just this, he is fit to be a king. Let's make him our king. And Jesus withdrew. He was like, nope. And then he walks on water and really freaks out his friends. Um, and, uh, but then the people, the masses, Jesus and the masses, the masses were still chasing after him. And he calls them out. 
saying, you're just following me because you realize that I can fill your belly up. Yeah. So John 6, 27, 36 says, do not work. This is Jesus speaking to them. says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. You see what he's saying? God the Father set his seal on me. That's what he's saying. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Honestly, this is just like a placement question because they just want more bread. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. I think like Jesus is constantly pointing at his chest, like me, it's me. You've you got to believe in me. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? Like, you got any more fish and bread? Maybe a little wine? Maybe a little water that we can turn into wine like we heard you did, right? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. What are you going to do? How are you going to top that? Huh? Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, which I am familiar with these words. This is like Jesus saying, like, dude, look me in the eyes. <laughs> I am telling you something deep. Get with me, right? That's what he's saying. Like, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. See what he's saying? He's like, me, me, it's me, it's me, it's me. Give us that bread always, said the people, again, still thinking with their bellies. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst deep, 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 deep. These are words of Jesus's that we cannot forget, but we often do, but it's okay. Uh, and the thing about Moses, because Jesus intentionally brought up a dude who also has a paternity in question. You see, because what I see here is that people do not want to believe what Jesus is saying. I am the son of God. Jesus is saying, I am the son of God. In fact, John, the author of this book, that's what we read, that in, in chapter 20 it says, these signs and wonders and more, right? These are recorded so that you will know, so that you will see and understand that Jesus is indeed the son of God, that he was indeed the son of God, that he still is the son of God, right? And he was sent to you and me so that if we believe, we will not perish but have boom, boom. And the thing about Moses is that he was another dude in a different time to Jesus's, who also had paternity issues. Paternity issues, which is actually what I titled this. I know it sounds weird, but paternity issues and genetics. <laughs> just bear with me. Just hang in there. Because the thing about Moses is that his story starts back in Exodus, where we can see another issue with family of origin. Right? Poor Moses. His life was spared from a massive baby holocaust. Like, it was Egypt. Egypt was what, in Jesus' time as Rome, this was Egypt, right? But it was different because they had the people of Israel as slaves. They were slaves in Egypt. And they were getting too big. And they were like, oh, you know what? The only way that we can handle this is by getting rid of their babies, their baby boys. <laughs> terrible, terrible. And uh, so, you know, his parents, his, his mom saves his life. And he, sent, he ends up being raised by the group that had his blood relatives enslaved. So he has this massive identity crisis, right? Because he's been adopted into a new family, but his every bit of himself just feels, he feels for the people who are in suffering under this other group that he's now part of, but he knows. He must have looked very different, I think. So through him though, and through his story, God set the people of Israel free from slavery in Egypt. And also through Moses, God provided for the people in the wilderness, and it was Moses, the one who received the Ten Commandments, which is what then Jesus and the Jews and the Pharisees refer to the law of Moses. What they are holding against Jesus, saying, but the law of Moses tells us this and this and that. What do you say about that? But the law of Moses says, don't do miracles on the Sabbath. But you're doing miracles on the Sabbath. But the law of Moses says, so many things that they're calling upon. And Moses was another person whose paternity was also questioned, also came under crisis. So it just makes me think that God will use your broken or weird background. So if you're sitting in this place 
And maybe like me, or maybe like some of the people that you've heard from, or, or maybe like many other Christians, right? Maybe we have a weird background, a weird family dynamic, maybe just an aunt or not. You know, we don't talk about Bruno. Are you familiar? Yeah. Right. Like, we all have family relatives or things that we're like, I don't know, that's not necessarily, I, I don't want to talk about Bruno at church. I don't want to talk to Bruno about, like, about Bruno with my friends. I'd rather disassociate myself from my family background. I don't know that. And, and you know, what's crazy is that just like Moses, right, God will use, like it says in Romans 8, that he works all things together for our good, for those who love him, to fulfill the purpose for which he created us. And the case with Jesus is that he was so set on helping us and people in his time believe that he is indeed the son of God. John 6, 40, 44 says this. Oh, yes, I love it because people are like, who is he? Somebody says, is, this, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? We like know exactly where he came from. No. The masses can love you sometimes for what you can give them, right? Your joy, your peace, your charisma, right? Maybe people delight in having you. Maybe your teachers even as a good student, whatever, right? But at the end of the day, sometimes they cannot overcome your full story. Maybe they judge you for where you come from. Maybe they judge you for many things. Isn't that, isn't that just the girl who goes to BA? Isn't that her? Isn't that the girl who, and she's like, oh my gosh, it's me. <laughs> isn't that just that homeschool girl? Like, isn't that, who does she think she is? Like out there doing like praise and worship or like going on missions or who does she think she is? Who is that guy? Isn't that just so-and-so's brother? Wasn't that guy like a weirdo? I know everyone is looking around like, oh my gosh, she knows. <laughs> yeah, I do. But just so you know, when people are looking at you and thinking and looking at your origins and at your family and the house that you live in and the clothes that you wear, maybe they're just saying, who does she think she is? Who do they think they are? Truth be told, guys, I don't know what I'm doing standing up here <laughs> or living the life that I live. Because if you only knew about me, you would probably also think like, who does she think she is? And I just want to say what great comfort it gives us that the Son of God experienced this. What great comfort it gives us to recognize Claire and Diego. What great comfort it gives us to recognize that God, whose eyes are on us, whose plan is for us, sees and recognize maybe it's not for the masses. Maybe the masses don't need to approve of what I am doing in my life. Just something that I wanted to share with you to think about. Then there's also the interaction of Jesus and the Pharisees, which chapter 8 is phenomenal. It says, Jesus, it's, this, is, this is where Jesus shows up saying, I am the light of the world. Right? I am the light of the world, which is also how the chapter begins. But it is John speaking uh, like John the Baptist did when John was talking about Jesus. Is John B, that's John, John the Baptist, and then John the author, okay? So two different Johns, two different people, right? John, Johnny B, <laughs> Johnny B is the guy who was kind of weird and a prophet and the one that prepared the way for the Lord. The other John, John is John the author. Also, I think there's other Johns, okay? So just don't get tripped with the Johns. But the Pharisees accused Jesus of bragging after he said, I am the light of the world, right? And he, they said, your testimony cannot be true. Now, remember, the Pharisees are the upper tier of, like, educated in the law of Moses folk. Like, they walk around in robes and, like, snooties. And, like, on Sabbath, they don't move a finger because, you know, they had to protect the Sabbath. And it just, it, they're, and they were completely put off that this Jesus character was doing all of these things. And that they were not informed. Like, did we miss the memo? Like, why would God not pick one of us to be the Messiah? We were all kind of expecting that. But no, it's this guy who has no training, no training, no qualification, no titles, right? Says the Pharisees accused him that his testimony was not true. Jesus tells them they don't know him. 
where he comes from or where he is going. He says that their judgment is according to the flesh. Jesus' judgment is not his own. It's his father's who sent him. And Jesus says, oh, in John 8, chapter 8, verses 17 and 19, it says, in your law, it is written, in your law, talking to the Pharisees, in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him before, no, the Jews said, they, they said to him, therefore, where is your father? Which I just want you to know, this is a jab at Jesus's physical father, who was a man named Joseph, who married Mary, while Mary was already expecting Jesus. So what do you know? People nowadays and people in the old days freaking out over a pregnancy that did not match up <laughs> with the wedding date. So it's like, Where's your father? Hmm? 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 Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. And this is also a big accusation because these people are supposed to stand for knowing all about God. He says, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. So I have a question for you to think about. Do you bear your family's resemblance? Do you have physical traits that you're like, that if I saw you and then I asked you next week, please bring a family picture and we just toss like, and you're not in it. You're not in it. You're not in the family picture. It's like a picture of your parents, right? And then we just mix it up right here. And then I pull it out. Would we be able to tell who you are based on that image? Uh-huh. I see a lot of nods like, yes, I look exactly like my people. All right, and then here's another question. By knowing them, would somebody be able to pick you out as their kid? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I have some like, mm, I don't know about that. Okay, so to some people, it's like, maybe not by the looks, but maybe by our actions. Maybe by the way we sound when we speak. Maybe our mannerisms give us away, right? Like, I don't know if you look like your mom and dad. I actually, I'm like a carbon copy of, like, my mom's side of the family. We're all short. <laughs> and we have a lot of hair in our heads. That's just, that's just it. But um, it's funny because maybe this is something that, like, when you were younger, you were like, my dad is strong and my dad is tall and I can't wait to be like my dad. And maybe the older that you get, you're like, yeah, I, I think I can, I'm cool being just my own person. Maybe. Maybe you're like, yeah, I really want to grow up to be just like my mom. Or maybe you're like, I don't know. I think, I think I'm okay. Not, not, like maybe being my own person. If someone knows your father, do they identify you as his kid? It's a question, huh? And if they know you, can they associate who you are to your parents? My dad passed away when I was eight years old. And prior to that, he um, spent some time in jail. Six years, to be precise. When I was two years old, um, my sister was born. And that same year, before getting a chance to meet her, he went to jail uh, because he was a drug dealer. And, uh, and then when he went back home, after the time that he spent, in jail, he um, he died, like he was murdered, and uh, and I was eight years old, and uh, I have very specific moments with him that I remember, and I remember him, maybe a little bit like a dream, and. Uh, and the things that I remember about him are sometimes very specific. Like, I remember his handwriting. Because when he was in jail, which I didn't know he was in jail, I thought he was a pilot. And all my life, I waved at airplanes when they went by. <laughs> because I thought it was my dad. <laughs> I know, it's heartbreaking. But also, I thought it was cute. So I wasn't, like, suffering in that season. I, it was comfortable to think that he was a pilot and he was <laughs> flying every airplane that ever passed by. But he wrote me letters, and he drew pictures for me. 
And I, he had a very particular way of writing. He used a ruler always, and his handwriting was like slanted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it was awesome. And I learned how to read earlier so that I could, like earlier in life, so that I could read his letters by myself because my mom would just cry and I just wanted to read them by myself. And so it, it's crazy how things in life tell you. But a couple of years ago, uh, in 2017, we went to Colombia and we visited a little bit with my grandma who had some health issues at the time and she was just a little bit weak, had already started to feel a little weak. She's still alive, she's still with us. Um, but she saw all three of the boys walk in, Diego, Lucas, and Rafa, and Felix. I was pregnant with Felix. Um, and uh, I, I caught with my eye that she whispered something to my aunt and pointed at one of the boys, and she whispered. And I know my family well, so I knew I had to find out what that was all about. And uh, my aunt told me later, she didn't want to tell you because she didn't want to upset you, and she didn't want to say anything in front of the boys, even though there was a language barrier, but she was being kind. And she just thought that one of my sons was the spitting image of my dad. Not how he looked, but how he walked how he moved his hands, how he greeted her hello. And I, I just, I've thought of that often because none of my sons have ever seen my dad in action. They've never seen him move around. Like, I, I was eight when he passed away. Like, it just, it sends chills down my back thinking that some connections are just made, and I'm not saying that any of my kids are going to grow up to be like my dad, in the name of Jesus, no, <laughs> but there is, isn't that crazy sometimes to think what genetics can do, there is like a trace in all of us, like a, like an essence, like a flavor, and the part that really captures my attention is that I really do believe that because God, Father God created us all, and he knew us before he formed us in our mother's womb, we belong to him. And the God of the universe has an even stronger pull on you and on me and on my children than even our ancestors do. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Jeremiah 1.5 says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. But anyway, in John 8, 23, 30 says, he said to them, you are from below. This is Jesus talking. After they were rude to him and told him, hey, who's your father? Who's your daddy? <laughs> I don't know why, but I have this feeling like that in the 90s, that was a big thing, like, who's your daddy? I don't even know on what reference. What is that a reference to? Was it a show? I don't know. I'm looking at Andrew because I'm like, who's your daddy? Where did that come from? Like, who's your daddy? Is that like? Are you proud that I'm your father and that you're my son? Is that how is that is that how that? Oh, it's like a seniority thing, like I'm bigger than you type of thing. Rude. Okay, well, I think God calls the biggest. I think God pulls the biggest seniority in all of us, right? But that's kind of like how they were using it with him. Like, who's your dad, right? Who's your dad? And this is what Jesus said: You are from below, and I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. He who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. And so down below it says, and he who sent me is with me. That's what Jesus says. Oh, wait, no, I have to read this part. It says, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man like on the cross, maybe, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Can, I just, can we just point out that Jesus' obedience is our reward? I think you and I can think of Jesus as our very best big brother. I don't know if you have a big brother. And if your big brother is a jerk, 
I'm sorry, okay? Don't think of Jesus as your big brother. <laughs> think of Jesus as the best big brother ever because in obedience to the Father, he came and laid down his life so that you and I would receive the good news that we belong to God's family because he made a way for us. Because he came from the Father and he didn't act on his own, which was easy for him to do because he was 33 years old and a man. He could have acted on his own, but he just kept on saying to everyone, the masses, and now the people who were judging him. And he was like, I'm not acting on my own. I, you don't see the resemblance between us because you have never seen the face of the Father. But I have seen the face of the Father, and I can tell you I am his son. And the things that I say and the things that I do reflect on who he is. And he's moved to compassion, and that's why I'm here. That's what Jesus is saying. Time and time again, that's what he's saying. So his obedience is our reward. But to those who opposed him, Jesus turned and said, because they were like, our father is Abraham. We know who our father is. You don't know who your father is. <laughs> and Jesus is like, I don't think you know who your father is because your actions do not match your DNA. Yeah, that's what he told them. Not in those words because DNA is not in the Bible. But like he said to them, your actions actually match your father, the devil. Dun, dun, dun. He was like the father of lies and deception. You hear my words, which are the truth, and you don't recognize them as the truth because your mind is completely filled with lies. That you are too good and you don't need me. That you can do this on your own. That you can fulfill the law of Moses and you can make a way for yourself to get to heaven. That's what he's saying to them. Do you think they understood? No, not one word. Because there is something about that. There is something about lies. And how different they are from the truth. Do we know the difference between lies and the truth? You're probably like, yeah, I do. It's kind of simple. But what about the things that we believe about ourselves and our identity? The things that when we look at ourselves in the mirror and we see maybe the image of a father who isn't great or a mother who isn't great. And the thing that we believe ourselves that is, I'm going to grow up to be just like them. That ain't the truth. And it is time for us in this age, right now, not a minute to waste. To do a real, take a real DNA test before God. If you have believed in Jesus as the son of God, you are a brand new creature. All things are gone, and he is making a brand new thing. I have it. There's a really good verse in here about this, and I cannot find it. Hold. Hold, please. Hold. No, I can't find it. It's okay. It will come back, and then I'll be like, ooh. Anyway, there's one more issue of paternity and genetics that I see. And I just barely have the time to talk about it because you guys are going to small groups. But Jesus in chapter 9 encounters a man who is blind. And his disciples pose the question, okay, so did this man, like, was it his parents' sin or did he sin as a newborn? Why was he born blind? And so Jesus is like, I'm going to show you that it is all for a greater purpose. Because I am the light of the world, and this man is about to see and truly see for the first time. And do you know what Jesus does? Yes, he does. He puts mud in the guy's eyes. Not Maybe not in? Is it an anointed? Yeah, I just see it like, but what did the mud, what was the mud made out of? Come on, smarties. Spit. And what else? Dirt river that's exactly it and what about this mixture of you know in genesis whenever the curse happened and it broke loose and adam and eve disobeyed and they chose a different life than the one that they had with god which was amazing in the garden right and the curse falls on this ground and jesus picks up from that ground like, let me just put it this way. Jesus had done it before. He had asked a man who had spent all of his days by a pool waiting for a miracle. And he asked him, 
hey, do you want to be healed? This man, no question. No question. He just spit on some dirt and he made some mud and didn't even give the guy a choice. <laughs> like, you can't see what I'm doing. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> You'll have time to get grossed out about this later. <laughs> Except for no, because it was the divine DNA of the Son of God mixed up with some cursed ground that anointed this man's eyes to change his life forever, forever. Do you want to know what happened next? The people who were persecuting Jesus always were like, it's Sabbath. How dare Jesus make a miracle and heal a man that's blind forever on a Sabbath? Couldn't he wait till Monday? Like, who makes a case like that, right? And then they go and ask the guy, and the guy's like, it was Jesus, a man named Jesus. And now I can see, like, well, first of all, Jesus told the guy, there were instructions to follow. Like, he put that holy mud on his face, on his eyes, and then told him, you need to go to this pool and wash yourself there. Do you want to know what the pool was called? The Bible says it. It spells it out. Scent. Scent. A body of water that represents who Jesus himself is saying that he is. I am sent from heaven for you. So the man obeys and goes and does, and does that, and then he can see. And then everyone around him is like, isn't that the guy who was begging, all like sitting there blind all of these years because he was born blind? So the people who are like after Jesus, they're like, we do not believe it. It's on Sabbath, but also, how do we know that this man was really born blind? Was he pretending all these years? So they call his parents. And his parents, guys, have the nerve to say, yeah, that's our son. Yeah, he was born blind. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I, I don't want to be associated with that kid. I he was always weird. Ask him, ask him yourself. I, I think he can see now. So he'll see you coming. So you can ask him yourself. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight. And then they asked his parents, and the parents said, ask him. Even if your own family does not bear testimony of what God is doing in you, God is still for you. The greater purpose of this man seeing that Jesus told his disciples about was that this man was really going to get to see the Son of God and know the Son of God. I want to pray for you real quick because I think to myself, sometimes I'm really grateful that I am associated with my family and sometimes I'm not. But I am never not glad that I have a new DNA, a new family relationship with my big brother Jesus, with my savior Jesus with my advocate, Jesus, and that I belong to the family.